this morning my presentation is on efforts towards a multi satellite radiance assimilation in regional models for track forecasting of tropical cyclones so if we look at tropical cyclones in north indian basin so you, the you can see that there has been a dramatic increase in the computing power but there is no dramatic reduction in track errors so this is in spite of the fact that we have powerful models you got powerful computers you got powerful algorithms whatever but if you can see the errors you can see that basically at t plus 48 which is the green so you can see that if you still have an error of about uh, you still have an error of about 200 kilometers okay so this information is from the uk met office website so if at all you want to have a strategy for dramatic reduction in track errors the basic problem with this is if you have a error band of 300 kilometers at t minus 48 hours you can't possibly give a useful uh, uh, disaster warning and uh, message or whatever to the civil administration for them to have to take appropriate action for mitig preparedness leave alone mitigation so if we are able to reduce it to plus or minus 50 or 75 kilometers 48 hours ahead of the cyclone then we can do something we can shift cattle men and all this so right now for example typically october november december there plenty of this plenty of cyclonic activity in the bay of bengal so 48 hours ahead of the landfall the typical uh, imd forecast will say between nellore and kadalur people who are familiar with the geography will say between nellore and kadalur is uh, kadalur is 200 km south of chennai and nellore is 200 km ahead of chennai so they have a, they want to have a very safe margin and basically presently it's all statistical <laughs> using imagery they find out the i and then they extrapolate and compare it with past data and try to try to extrapolate so needless to say it has been, this must have been discussed okay threadbare in this uh, conference and also in the workshop forecasting is an initial value problem so assimilation gives you a scope for direct injection of observations from satellite into numerical calculations it can be continuously done even at one hour intervals if you have a geostationary satellite in place so er so that errors do not build up so it is the only rational way to improve short term forecasting so you can do whatever you can have whatever model you you want but there are certain infirmities in the model which you cannot do away with and i i'll talk more about the major limitations of the models so if you look at microwave radiance assimilation so among all the assimilation techniques radiance assimilation is the best among all among and if you look at radiance assimilation the best among all is microwave radiance assimilation so i need to justify why microwave radiance assimilation is the best because microwaves alone can penetrate the clouds and the microwaves contain the crucial hydrometeor signature so this hydrometeor signature is critical for a successful track forecasting of cyclone because because the cyclone is inherently a very heavily precipitating system so the theory of radiance assimilation is as follows this is what is the, typically known as the bayesian framework the probability of finding the state of the atmosphere x for a given set of observations y the y could be the brightness temperatures of your infrared image infrared sounder or it could be the brightness temperatures of your microwave imager so the probability of the getting the state of atmosphere x for a given set of observations y is equal to the probability of getting a set of brightness temperatures for the given state of the atmosphere x multiplied by any prior information you already have about the state of the atmosphere now this is the this is called the ppdf or the posterior probability distribution probability density function so the posterior probability density function can be written as exponent minus of this this can be this is some sort of a least square now you, the critical thing is you let account for the observational error as well as the forward model error so so the the whole thing works like this you have a set of observations of a brightness temperature that is the radiances which are captured the top of the atmosphere radiances which are captured by the satellite so and you have y simulated which is the simulated brightness temperatures for your assumed value of x in general these two will not agree therefore <coughs> and when you are simulating the brightness temperatures there is an error associated with the forward model that is a radiative transfer simulation okay that we can quantify by the same token you also have an observational error which is typically spoken like the ne delta t of the any of, of the instrument so you have got o and f 
and then so this is the probability y given x so is e to the power of so if you take minus ln of p of y it is basically it comes to it comes to a least square minimization now this probability of the, the p of x is the prior information we already have about x so this prior information is basically coming from where so this x x b is coming from the background that means if if you want to do the assimilation at 6 hours after you start the calculations at 00, zero you start your calculations and proceed your, and proceed with your wrf or whatever model you have you will get some values of the x at the end of 6 hours now you can assume you can start guessing the value of x and this will give you the difference between the x and the xb now this so this also is associated with an uncertainty that is given by the background covariance matrix the back, background covariance matrix in a typical community software like the wrf is calculated by suppose you start from 00, zero of today you start from 00, zero of 14th july so you can do 24 hour simulations and get the values of x at 00, zero on 15th july it is also possible for you to start for 12 o'clock today and reach the same 00, zero tomorrow and then you can find out the difference between the 24 and the 12. That gives you how the errors are propagated. So typically they do it over a 30 day period and all this globally and then this gives an approximate idea of what is the, what is the background covariance matrix associated with this model. So therefore the P of X, the P of X is an information, the P of X is an information which is already available to you even before you start doing the assimilation. So this comes from, this comes from your knowledge of thermodynamics or WRF, this basically comes from the model, this basically comes from the radiative transfer model, this comes from your radiative transfer observations. So therefore you are optimally combining, you are multiplying these two to get a posterior probability density function. Therefore you have the thermodynamic model, you have information, you have information and the forward model error, the observation error, as well as the background covariance matrix. You have measurements, you also have radiative transfer simulation. Therefore, you are able to marry measurements with theory, the theory coming from the thermodynamics, also from the radiative transfer. So therefore, assimilation lies at the root of science and engineering. That is the most rational way to attack this problem. Maximizing Px given y is analogous to minimizing minus ln of P of x of y. So the minus ln P of x of y is, is very conventional, it is known as the cost function or objective function in the parlance of optimization. This optimization could be used by, could be accomplished by using calculus or non-calculus based techniques. So the radiative transfer problem we have for this assimilation, if you want to assimilate, assimilate microwave radiances, is a very high dimensional inverse problem because the satellite outputs are radiances. The numerical, metal, uh, numerical weather model works with an atmospheric variables like temperature, humidity and hydrometeors. Hydrometeors are basically the, uh, the cloud, liquid water, cloud, ice, precipitating water, precipitating ice. Of course, for the tropical countries, if you look at mid latitudes and so on, you, you should also include snow, gropel and all that. So typically, for example, the TRMM, the most successful uh, uh, mission of NASA and JAXA, so it has got five channels and two polarization, so you've got 10 signals. So there is 10 minus one, it is actually nine. The parameters to be retrieved are, basically if you divide the atmosphere into 14 layers, if you have 14, four hydrometeors per layer, you have to, you, you have to retrieve something like 56 parameters. So there could be several combinations of the 56 parameters which may give rise to the same signature, that is a nine brightness temperatures. Therefore, essentially you are starting off with a severely ill post problem. So the key challenges in assimilation are a powerful radiative transfer model for simulating top of the atmosphere microwave radiative microwave radiances in a precipitating atmosphere. Specification of the prior information, it basically comes from the mesoscale model, a robust and fast optimization retrieval algorithm for the radiative part of the problem and a fast forward model for rapid, rapidity in assimilation. I will talk about this in a little while. So as far as the, the meso scale model which we are trying to use in our study is the advanced research WRF, a widely used community meso scale model developed by NCAR. It is a fifth generation meso scale model, can be used for both research and operational applications. It has its own data assimilation system which they claim will advance both understanding and improve the prediction of meso scale. That is why I have put suppose to and I also put an exclamation mark. All these are pretty well known, the, the, the governing equations are the continuity equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, the energy equation and the equation of state for an ideal gas. So it's a basic form of Eulerian equations of fluid motion. 
So it integrates a compressible non-hydrostatic no Euler equations and uh, the equations are cast in flux form and we have got a, you use a terrain following mass vertical coordinate. These are all pretty standard. So horizontal grid, time integration, spatial, disintegra spatial discretization, earth's rotation, nesting is basically one way, two way and mo moving nest. You can have progressively finer grids towards the scene of action and then coarser grids away from the scene of action and two way in information can be passed on two way between the loops. So these are all some of the uh, some of the features in the model mapping to sphere and model physics. Now model physics, these are the inbuilt options available in the community model. Microphysics, cumulus parametrization, boundary layer physics, land surface physics, radiation, long wave schemes and short wave schemes. So the first thing we'll have to do is, so the model it's like this, you get the initial and initial condition and boundary condition of a global forecast system, then introduce it into, a PA, uh, into the preprocessor and then put it into your dynamic solver and this is all done in the NCAR command language called the NCL. So first we wanted to do a sensitivity study of the various set of options available in WRO to, to get a better representation of, to, to get a better forecast of tropical cyclones. So the main objectives of this part of the study were to analyze the impact of various physical parameterization in propagation and intensity of tropical cyclones, to find out the best combination of physics for predicting track and intensity of cyclone in the North, North Indian Ocean. So this experiment, rather the numerical experiment is conducted by choosing several physics parameterization schemes, then analyzing the impact of the particular parameterization in track and intensity. So the benchmark you're using is the JTWC, John Typho Joint Typhoon Warning Center of the US Navy, uh, which releases observational data for cyclones. Okay, the sensitivity studies we initiated with the tropical cyclone gel, two numerical, two sets of experiments were conducted, one to find the best schemes for track prediction and the other for uh, intensity. Some people may wonder why, 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 why do you want to do experiments, one to find the best schemes for track prediction and other for intensity. People working on the short term forecasting will know that the schemes for the best track prediction invariably are not the best for the intensity point of view. So. The, the, so I think the, we'll, we'll see that in a little while. Totally 56 experiments are conducted to, fig, to find out the best set of physics schemes for track intensity and prediction. So the, and after numerical experiments are conducted, the best scheme was selected based on the propagation of simulated track error and RMS errors with respect to JTWC observational data. So the model domain is like this. Okay, I'll give you the specification. So this is one, two, and three. So the, okay, the horizontal grid distance for one, two, three are 90 kilometer, 30 kilometer, and 10 kilometer respectively. And the number of grid points, the latitude and longitude are given in domain one, domain two, and do domain three. The number of vertical layers is 27. The central point of the domain is 70 degrees east and 16 degrees north. And then the time step is basically for each of this. So for the domain one, it was 270 seconds. For the domain two, it was two seconds, uh, 90 seconds. And for domain three, it was 30 seconds. So these are some of the results of the numerical experiments to track, pro track propagation of uh, cyclone gel. I'm sorry for the uh, poor readability because we wanted to pack a lot of things in one slide. So this red is the JTWC data. And this, these are basically uh, the results which we get by changing one scheme at a time. When all the other schemes are held fixed, you change the cumulus parameterization, you change the uh, radiation schemes and all that. So these are, these are the model predictions. So I'll give you a summary of this. So if you look at the track error with JT, uh, JTWC observations, you can see that the track errors are going like this. So this, it's the same thing remains. So you can see that most of the errors are basically, if, you, if you're looking at forecast time of 48 hours, you're having somewhere around 100 to 150 kilometers. Okay, so these are the various schemes and the predictions with various schemes. Now, we identified the best set of physics options and corresponding RMS errors. So, as far as the cumulus parameterization is concerned, we have used the Kane free scheme. Oh, the physics of all this is available in the WRF manual. It's also been well documented in papers, right? So, planetary boundary layer, then microphysics, Kessler scheme, and these are the schemes which we have finally zeroed in on. And then this is basically the error versus time, 6 hours, 12 hours, and then we have taken an RMS error of uh, the RMS error is about 61 kilometers for the best setup, for the best scheme. We also did some studies to find out the best scheme for getting close match 
for the maximum sustained wind speed which gives you an idea of the intensity of the cyclone so the again the performance of the various the performance of the various schemes are given here so the key observations from this uh, numerical experiment or parametric study is the best set of physics options with respect to track error over predicts the intensity of the cyclone for example gel hence further experiments are conducted to determining the best set of physics op options for intensity prediction so we looked at maximum wind speed and then so the best set of physics options for intensity prediction is this so these are the uh, various options which we, which we finally zeroed in on and you can see that the error the rms error is about 1.8 meters per second that is the maximum error in this uh, the rms error in the maximum sustained wind speed in the in the cyclone okay then we did this now using the best set of options we tried the best set of options we tried we tried the best we tried the best set of options, we tried the best set of options for Cyclone Isla and then we found out that we took some random scheme and found out the RMS error and then this was about, uh, RMS error was 90.4 kilometer the random scheme. Now with the best scheme we are able to reduce the random error to 68.3. All this is without assimilation. Now this is uh, the restatement of the optimization problem, basically you are minimizing the cost function. It is the same thing restated in a different language and now as far as observations are concerned so we use the NCEP global upper air observations and then these are fed into the ARW ARW var which does the assimilation so the other parts are the same now there is an inner loop where you keep on iterating till you solve the till you get a minimum cost function so in the community software WRF this is done using the conjugate gradient method so we do 100 iterations of the inner loop and then we assimilate these upper air observations now the global upper air observation, the following variables were uh, assimilated, air temperature, dew point temperature, geopotential height, pressure and wind direction and speed. Ah. Yeah, okay. No, 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 okay. Yeah. Mm. What, what, what? Focus. you can also get observations okay can I, can I complete I have some I have already been one yeah. I am nowhere near the end <laughs> I've just started <laughs> ah, okay. okay so these are the various aircraft measurements Okay, so these are the upper air observations. So, land station, this is the ship observation, rowing ship, and these are the various satellites. You can see that uh, the WRF is already assimilating Kalpana information from Kalpana, uh, infrared derived cloud motion, visible derived cloud motion, as well as water vapor derived cloud, cloud motion. Okay, so the, the source of this information is this. Now, this is the model domain, these are the available observations. Okay corresponding to this model domain. Okay, this is an explanation for the acronyms. Now you can see for Cyclone Lila, to cut a long story short, without assimilation, the RMS error is 87.9. With assimilation, it is 68.4. This nothing great. I have not done the radiance assimilation. This is just the data assimilation from data which is available to the community model. Now, but the story is not so rosy because for Cyclone Lila, Without assimilation, the RMS error is 159 kilometer. With assimilation, the RMS error is 561 kilometers. Whenever, whenever a cyclone curves, after landfall, if a tree emerges, the WRF, it, it is the water loop for the, for the mesoscale model. 
that uh, when it's recurving, it's very extremely difficult to capture. Professor uh, Ravi will agree with me so on this. Okay, so what is the story? If you start doing DA with inbuilt options, so I am presenting a case for having this workshop on the conference. <laughs> so if you just use default DA using apparent observation, the success is only mixed and sporadic. For one cyclone, it will work. For the other cyclone, you so it leaves you highly unsettled. So the key to get a better skill lies in getting the hydrometeors right. The hydrometer representation is extremely poor because you'll have to do you'll have to do cloud you have to do it on a one kilometer by one kilometer. It is possible to do on a one kilometer by one kilometer even in WRF, but the cumulus parameterization is not all that good. So the, the that is a cloud microphysics is not very good in the WRF. So people have tried. So just like there is a direct numerical simulation for solving the turbulent flow equations. So this cloud resolving model is akin to the DNS in fluid mechanics. Even that, even that is not able to give accurate representation of hydrometeors. In fact, for various cyclones we have compared, for various cyclones we have compared 24 hour rain accumulation with WRF and the TMI, TMI data, TMI rainfall, the correlation coefficient is only 0.4. The correlation coefficient is varies between 0.4 and 0.44. The TMI with the precipitation radar itself, the agreement is only 0.6. Okay, so I will say that the hydrometer representation is the Achilles heel in the WRF model. So, and uh, fortunately for us, this hydrometer information comes from a microwave imager. Regardless of the fact that it is a low earth orbiting satellite, it's a polar satellite in the sense that Temporarily, you will not get uh, information continuously over 24 hours because there will be a overpass over your region of interest. The quality of the information is critical. So, you have so much of upper air observation, the quantity of information is huge. In fact, there is a deluge of information. But the quality of the information is questionable. So, therefore, we are not able to get, we are not able to get we are better results with assimilation basically because wherever the cloud activity is not there. When there is only clear sky, if we keep on assimilating, how much is it going to improve in the region in which, in the, in, in the region in, in which, in the region of interest to you, namely the cyclones where there is low pressure and where there are spir uh, spiraling rain bands and so on. So, hydrometer representation, the Achilles heel in the, uh, in this story. Therefore, you will have to start looking at retrievals of cloud and rain profiles. I have given this talk several times in this hall, so not in this hall, one floor below. So, that is the radiative part of the story. So, basically you consider a one dimensional plane parallel medium and then model this using the radiative transfer equation. And then this is basically a overview of the forward model. We have developed this forward model from uh, Pradeep Tapliyal is also there. From 2002 onwards, IIT Madras has been having projects with SAC. Over the last 10 years, we have built a forward model, uh, ab initio model, with for, uh, which is written in Fortran. So, with this, we are able to, you, you can uh, simulate the microwave brightness temperatures and the frequencies of interest to any satellite. And this is basically the radiative transfer equation. You've got integral terms on one side and differential terms on the other side. So it's an integral differential equation. So we use the Bayesian methodology, which I've explained before. So the advantage of the Bayesian is whatever information you have can be used. And whatever information ha you have can be weighted. And the confidence in the information is inversely proportional to the stand to the sigma. If the sigma is more, then you, you give less weight to that information. If sigma is less, you give more weight to that information. So this is how we retrieved. Now I'll go through how many more minutes I have. I've already minus two minutes. Okay, then I'll slow down the train. So, <laughs> so the retrieval of rainfall. So to the forward problem is to find brightness temperatures given atmospheric constant. The inverse problem is to find atmospheric constant given the brightness temperature. Forward model is a polarized microwave model. Inverse, we have used the Bayesian retrievals. So this I have explained before. This is how the Americans have, done, uh, have tried to conquer this problem for the TMI. So they conducted uh, dedicated experiments for four seasons. These are called the Toga core experiments. So near Papua New Guinea, New Guinea, and then they had uh, boy observations, aircraft observations, ship observations, and then they ran the cloud resolving model. They fine tuned it and generated the hydrometer profiles. These hydrometer profiles are used to run the forward model. Then they calibrated the forward model with the observations, and then they inverted, and then they 
estimated the instantaneous rainfall and it is available as data products to users all over the world. But the basic problem is if you want to generate the brightness temperatures, you need to know the you need to know the profile of the hydrometeors. The profile of the hydrometeors you cannot arbitrarily assume because the hydrometeors are very critical. Therefore, somewhere some circularity is involved. So far, what we have been doing is whatever was given by NASA, those profiles we have used in the training of the forward model. But there is a circularity here. There is a circularity here because those profiles are themselves retrieved profiles, they are not measured profiles. The basic problem is we don't have aircraft, sufficient aircraft measurements which will measure all the hydrometeors in the 14 kilometers of the atmosphere. Right? So the, the key to this may lie in using radar observations, radar echoes. Okay, so we use the Bayesian model and then Bayesian retrieval. So these are the various cyclones which we considered for developing our Bayesian model for the rainfall retrieval part and then we applied it to a tropical cyclone. We got reasonable, so this is the comparison with the TMI measurements. We got reasonable comparison. And then now we wanted to improve the accuracy of the radiative transfer simulations. So we used a collocative strategy where, where what we did now was, if you want to train the radiative transfer model, what we do is we run the mesoscale model from 0, 0 hours up to 6 hours or 12 hours. At the end of 6 hours, it generates temperatures, humidity, hydrometers and all that. We use this to train our radiative transfer model and compare it with observations. Again, the problem is the hydrometers are not very good. So what we did was, fortunately for us, the TRMM mission also has a precipitation radar. The precipitation radar is more accurate. It is more accurate than the microwave imager because it is an active instrument. So the reflectivity, the echoes, from the echoes, you can get the precipitating water and the precipitating ice. So precipitating water and precipitating ice from the NASA's precipitation radar and cloud liquid water and cloud ice from the WRF generated model, WRF predictions and humidity, humidity and temperature from WRF we used in training our radiative transfer model. So this is one part of the story. And then we tried in cyclone Nargis and found out the brightness temperatures. So now we have come to a stage now we have come to a stage where we are able to marry a thermodynamic model with the radiative transfer model. Okay, so we obtained various sea level, sea level pressure, sea surface temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, vertical profiles of pressure, temperature, relative humidity, and cloud water mixing ratio, which was which was bothering us for the last 10 years. Now, because we started working, because we started working in mesoscale models, we started working in numerical weather prediction, we are we are able to there is some synergy involved. We get these from the thermodynamic model. Therefore, this constant criticism that you use, you use some arbitrary profiles to, to train your radiator, whether it is thermodynamically consistent or not. This question was bothering us for a long time. Now, it is thermodynamically consistent because the model is also run up to exactly the same time at which the satellite is observing the rain event. So, these are the uh, temperature profiles obtained. These are the temperature various profiles, temperature profiles, pressure profiles, relative humidity profiles. Then these are the cloud liquid water profiles. So rain profiles, then cloud ice profiles and precipitating ice profiles. So we generated the database So this is one strategy. Now, if you recall the theory of radiance assimilation, there is a Y observation minus Y simulated. So when you want to do real time assimilation, then you have to repeatedly do solve the radiative transfer model because you have to give various guess values of the state of the atmosphere, solve your radiative transfer model and find out the error between the model prediction and the brightness temperature measured by the satellite. So this is very, very repetitive and you have to do it over so many pixels. Therefore, we developed a strategy where we will use a neural network. So this neural network will replace the radiative transfer model. So this is basically what we call as a fast RT model. So this neural network, so the reason for going for this is the in-house radiative transfer code takes six seconds to simulate brightness temperature for a given cloud scene. Okay. On a, this was on a four quad core machine, previously on a quad core machine. For comparison, the TMA onboard satellite makes a measurement of 116 profiles per second. So you can very well imagine the amount of time which is required to completely simulate for one scan of the satellite. Therefore, there is no question about the need for speeding up the computational time involved in calculations. So we gave 102 inputs, so 102 inputs and 9 outputs. Therefore, now we have, now after running this radiative transfer model, 
and using the WRF prediction for so many cyclones, we have a huge database and we have trained a neural network which can be used as a black box. So if you give the thermodynamic variables, if you give the hydrometer profiles, you will get the simulated brightness temperature which is ready to be used in your assimilation. Okay, now the training is like this. So you can see that we tried various, various architectures, 102 inputs and 9 outputs. The 102 inputs are 14 cloud liquid water, 14 cloud ice, 14 precipitating ice, 14 uh, humidities and all this, relative humidity. So we got a correlation coefficient of 99.99. So the uh, RMSE, the channel wise RMSE is less than 1 Kelvin. The channel wise RMSE is less than 1 Kelvin for all the channels. And the NE delta T for the NE delta T for trim is around one Kelvin. Pradeep, what is the NE delta T for uh, megatropics? Around one Kelvin. So the NE delta T. See, this NE delta T is very important. If you have a radiative transfer model which has got an error of five Kelvin, RMSE of five Kelvin, it's no use. Okay, because every two, or three, or four Kelvin will translate to an error of one millimeter per hour in the rainfall prediction. Because the brightness temperature is strongly correlated with the rainfall. So unless you get this right, because already you are making so many assumptions. So we have to get this right. Now we have come to a situation where the RMSE of the forward model, we are able to get less than 1 Kelvin. The observational errors are less than 1 Kelvin. The background covariance matrix, unfortunately, it is not under our control because the mesoscale model is not what we have developed. Whatever is available, you have used. But I think that is well settled. So whatever is available, we we'll use the background uh, covariance matrix from the WRF. Now everything is set, but that, that's it. I don't have results for the assimilation. We are all set for the assimilation. Next year, uh, if you call me, I'll, I'll give some results. <laughs> okay. So the work in progress. So integrating the microwave radiance assimilation into WRF in a Bayesian framework. The fast RD model for this is now ready. And it has got an excellent performance. RMSE, channel-wise RMSE is less than 1 Kelvin. For training and testing this approach, TRMM data will be used. So, integrating IR radiance with Goose data and Kalpana data with fast RD model. We have also been doing projects with uh, uh, SAC. Dr. Pradeep is a, Pradeep Taplial is a coordinator from the ISRO, from the SAC side. So, we, we have also developed a fast R, RT model for integrating INSAT 3D. So, this will also, we can have a fast RT model. So, if you give the thermodynamic profiles, you will get the IR brightness temperatures also. So, wherever you do not have clouds in your domain, those clear, under, this, under those clear sky, those pixels which are under clear sky, you can integrate the infrared also. That is why the, uh, the title of my talk is Towards a Multi-Satellite Radiance Assimilation. So, we will fine tune this suite of algorithms for maximizing the forecast skill. And finally, we will set up, now, now that Megatropics is going to be launched, finally it is going to be launched. Now that Megatropics is going to be launched and Insat 3D data will be available shortly. We should be able to integrate both this and then hopefully the track errors will come down. That is the hope. So the in-house computing facility IIT Madras. So we have a mini supercomputer Cray CX1. So, so it is, uh, this, what is this? 0.5, what is this called? 488.g flops is called 0.5 some teraflop. So it is, it is 0.5 teraflops. So it has got 72 cores. And uh, the, uh, the community model WRF is inherently is, uh, is parallelized, so we can take the full advantage. So we are able to run it on all the 64 cores. So additional computational facilities available at uh, IIT Madras. We also have the two, 2048 cores because of heavy load on this. Uh, because of heavy load on this, Cray is a much better option. In fact, it was available to us three years back also, but I argued that. At any point, they, they won't give more than 20 cores to, to a user. So the ontological anxiety or the existential crisis of why we bought a Cray is, is settled. So with Cray and all the radiative transfer simulations, now we transferred onto Cray in a Linux platform. We have put MATLAB onto this Cray. So from radiative transfer to infrared to microwave to WRF, everything is now running on the Cray and IIT is maintaining that. It is there in the computer center, so I have no issues. So. And create people anytime we call within one day they land up. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah.
Yeah, yeah, it is, it is still, it's, it's still ongoing. So with the limited studies, but otherwise you forever you will keep on running. Somewhere you have to set. See, it's very easy to say that with, we cannot generalize, but how do you make progress? Somewhere you have to stop this and you have to proceed. I, I didn't get you. I didn't hear you quite well. Ah. Hmm. Yeah, it's okay. Well taken. If you have to validate with the gold, the, the gold standard, we don't even know whether the rain gauge is the gold standard. So we have to, for, according to me, the gold standard will be the radar data. So, and radar over the open ocean is again a problem. But Americans have a radar in the open ocean, in the Pacific somewhere, so which the NASA people and Colorado, all these people, people who develop this TRMM are using this. Hopefully we will get access to that data. So finally my validation will be with the ground radar in the mimics the ocean conditions, open ocean. Yeah, integrated cloud liquid water, surface rain rate, and uh, the bright band, the location of the bright band. So there are some critical parameters. So how do you know that the, the whole thing is not over time and That's a good question, but so we need to have aircraft going like this and taking measurements. But only approximately we can validate. Your point is well taken. Why that structure should be like this and so some integrated values of the parameters we can validate. I mean, that is the best we can do under the present conditions. Is that you collaborate work with respect to the Florida campus or No, we have collaboration with uh, Professor Chandrasekhar, Colorado State. He has a chill facility, chill radar facility. So my student is going next month to Colorado for two months. He has already learned WRF, so he'll inter so he learned the assimilation of radar reflectivities. So that is this also an additional thing. So we want to use the US radar data for the assimilation. Please tell me about one more question. Just one more question. Yeah. No, this Jacobian is required only when you are using adjoint problem and all that. We are, uh, we are computationally solving using the Markov chain Monte Carlo. In the Markov chain Monte Carlo, I will give the state of the atmosphere. And then I will calculate the posterior probability distribution and I will work out the distribution. Wherever the probability is maximum, that is the most likely state of the atmosphere. See, if I am using a calculator, what you are saying is, the question is, why are you not taking the first derivative? Jacobian is required. So the neural network will not give the Jacobian. Or does the neural, as far as I know, can we get Jacobian? From, I don't think so. Yeah. So, neur so we, if my retrieval involves a calculus-based technique, what you are saying is perfectly right. But we are moving away from this calculus, so we are using the Bayesian framework. And the Bayesian is only a framework. But because we have got powerful resources and I have a fast model, I have the luxury to work out the probabilities for all states, for guess values of x. So I am killing the problem by so many computations.